This is Conversations at Hip Hop Closet on IG Live. You rocking with Marlon Rice, right? And we're here, Kai, my sister Kai is in the back. I saw she she threw on makeup today, so I'm I'm thinking she may want to come to the front at some point. We're gonna get her, yeah, we're gonna get her to come to the front at some point. But this is um a very special conversation that we're gonna have. And so I, I'm I'm happy that you're here. Pour yourself a glass of wine. We're gonna get into the weeds a bit, talking about the root of this culture, right? So on my way in, I was looking at what I had on, you know, and shout out to Fuse from 40 Acres and a Mule, he blessed me with this hoodie. And I was just looking at the hoodie and I was like, you know, okay, it's logo driven, it's heavily branded, it's a hoodie. What I got on would be defined as streetwear. This is streetwear, right? 40 Acres and a Mule is obviously a big film corporation. They are not necessarily purveyors of fashion, but they do make streetwear designs. Hundreds of companies make streetwear designs at this point. I have the honor of sitting next to one of the members of a group called Shirt Kings. And if you don't know who Shirt Kings are, you need to Google it immediately. So flip your phone up so that you don't lose us. If you got an iPhone, you can do that now. And Google really? Shirt Kings. Yeah, you can do that now. You can keep it playing while you pop off on the other apps. I want you to Google Shirt Kings. Shirt Kings are the seed of streetwear. No other organization can claim their place in streetwear before Shirt Kings. Not Dapper Dan, not Walker Wear, not Fubu, not Mecca, not Aniche, not any of the streetwear brands that you know and love from the 90s. So I got the pleasure of sitting with a brother that was part of a triumvirate that made this happen. You're going to love this story. I guarantee you we're about to have a ball. I want you to give it up. I want to introduce to some. I want to present to others. My brother, Faye. Faye. Good to see you. Yes. Yes. I'm so, honored, man. I'm, honored. I'm, I'm happy you're here. You, you just came back from Japan. You was talking. Yeah. 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 Great trip. My Good. second time to Japan. Uh -huh. And, uh. You know, when you're out there, you're constantly meeting more and more people, people introducing you to other people, you know, making right. connections and setting it up for the next, you know, for the next trip, right. you know? Right. And, you know, as a New Yorker, you know, that's what we do. You mm -hmm. know, we just like to expand. Yeah. You know, yeah. And it doesn't matter, matter like where you're at, who you are, we're going to maintain being who we are, you know, mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to push the culture. You know, mm -hmm. um, some people have the chance to go to these places before us, you know, but now they're asking for the foundation now. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. That's good business. I'm actually, you know, I'm trying to run, I'm trying to finish what's called the Added Six in the marathon world, and one of the marathons is the Tokyo Marathon. Oh, wow. So when I get out there, I'm definitely going to holler at you because I need okay. connectivity. Right. Oh, for sure. For I sure. want us to start at the very beginning. I want you to tell people who you are, where you're from, and give us a sense of the first time you became uh, intersected with hip hop. What was the first thing that you was like, okay, this is hip hop? So start with your uh, name, where you're from, and let's go into that. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Edwin Fade Sakasa. You know, I'm born in Brooklyn, East New York, also lived in Brownsville, and then moved to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we moved to the Bronx, you know, you know, I was just a kid, you know, and my brother, you know, who was like five, six years older than me, he got the gist of what was going on at that time, mm -hmm. you know, and coming from Brooklyn and going there, there was definitely something going on different, mm -hmm. you know, and my older brother embraced it, and he embraced all the elements mm -hmm. of hip-hop, you know, him and his friends would come home and they would, uh, you know, articulate these crazy stories about, you know, a guy named Cool Herc and Herculoids and, 
you know, Saturday morning, I'm like, you know, eating my cereal and I'm watching cartoon to hurt the Lord. So, you know, I was intrigued, like, wait up. This group is named after the cartoon. So I want to know more. You know? And uh, my brother was also a, a, a comic book buff, you know? So that made me that. He was an artist, so that made me an artist, you know? So I pretty much followed the leader. You know, he led until I took over, you know? Um, when we, you know, we left Brooklyn, we had the opportunity to move to either Queens, then we went out to Long Island, but these places didn't seem right, you know? And what the realtor did was say, we got a place in the Bronx for you right now, right? Um, it's a project. You'll just stay there for a couple of months and we'll put you in the house. We end up staying there like eight years. Mm-hmm. You know, so then. Which we, projects? Oh, it's called East Chester Project. East Chester. On okay. Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. Okay, yeah. Co op City, Gun Hill Project. Right, Co op City, shot to Co op City, right. Yeah, so okay. we were very, very close to the valley mm-hmm. where, um, you know, Rocky mm-hmm. is from. He's from mm-hmm. the valley. Mm-hmm. And he was definitely the guy that we had to go see when we wanted to hear that music. What was the first thing that you noticed about the Bronx that was totally different than Brooklyn? Oh, uh, the dancing. The dancing. The dancing. My brother came home and they were break dancing, spinning on their heads. Ah. Um, he wasn't doing that at Brooklyn at the time. Um, you know, because I, I still had cousins all over Brooklyn. We're the only family that moved to the Bronx. Uh, so we were there, you know, birthday parties, you know. Right. I spent summers there. Uh-huh. I spent the blackout summer in Wyckoff. Uh, summer you know? 77. Yeah. 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 yeah I, we was looking out the window and I seen the lights just go. <laughs> and, we, and, and it sounded like it was the end of the world because there was no sound at first. It right. was just pitch black. Right. And then people start screaming. Uh-huh. And it was it was a crazy feeling, you know. Uh-huh. Then we had to go downstairs and get my, my, my girl cousin and stuff like that. Right. right? Ten yeah. floors down. Right. But guess what? In that same building, Houdini lived in that building. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, hip hop lives here. Mm-hmm. But we weren't hip hop yet. Right. You know, that was just John and Joe from the 11th floor. Right. Right. You know? Right. And so I'm cool with John's brother, Dave. Rest in peace, John. But Dave oh, Fletcher oh, is my man. Dave. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, that's my guy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So our families grew up, you know, side by side. Mm-hmm. And I remember in 85, uh, meeting John and going up to meet uh, Mr. Magic. Mm. Mm. You know? 1985. Yeah. How old were you? Uh, must have been 18. 18. So let's pull back a little bit because you went to high school. High School of Art and Design. I went to the High School of Art and Design. Now, we were talking off camera about how, in a way, hip-hop as a culture was birthed in the New York City high school system. It definitely was. Right. So you went to Art and Design with whom? Tell, tell us some of the names you went to school with. Well, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest names first. Um, Mark Jacobs was in my homo class. Mark Jacobs was in your homo class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, my other shirt came half, mm-hmm. you know, Nike, mm-hmm. art design, mm-hmm. Kashim, art design, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Deck, Deck the Hyper. Deck mm-hmm. was out of East New York, an amazing artist. Right, graffiti guy. Yeah, graffiti. Right, Deck, yeah. Deck TBC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was a heavy influence on me and Nike, mm-hmm. you know. Dress wise, uh, style wise, mm-hmm. veteran wise, uh, cartoons, mm-hmm. you know, like that was, you know, I, I had a chance to, you know, revisit my East New York neighborhood because of him. You know, I would go there and spend the night out there and, you know, hitting the black book, hit the yard early in the morning with him, Too mm-hmm. Swift, App, you know, App was from Linden Plaza, mm-hmm. you know, just, just, just making rounds, you know? So I want to go into that very briefly because there's a process and a protocol 
to this thing called graffiti, right? They don't see it now. People that live now in New York City don't understand what I'm about to say and what we're about to talk about, but in the 80s, on the consumer side, so not on your side, but on my side, you would be standing in a train station, a train would come into the station, and the whole car would be like right, it looked like this, colors, with names, yes. right? Names, names and names. characters. Yeah. It was a sight to see. Yes. Yes. I want you to kind of give us a very brief kind of process of how you guys went about even doing that. Well, as, a, as I said before, you know, I followed at, hard after my brother. Right. And when he did the graffiti thing, it was like him and the whole team. And you know, I was that little brother that you had to take. Yeah, you gotta take you gotta go outside, you gotta take him with you. Yeah, right. He just couldn't leave me there. So right. he's like, man, I gotta bring this kid to the yard. He's like, you know, right. but he did. So you would go to train yards. Yeah, like nine years old and buy some tag. Really mostly motion tag. They mm -hmm. would ride from Bronx all the way to Brooklyn and ride back and just motion tag. So when you say motion tag, the train is moving? Yeah, it's in motion. Yes. And so are they on the outside of the train? How are they tagging it? Some are moving? in the middle, you know, others are in the, on the inside. Uh -huh. you know? Okay. This is just tagging your name. Just tagging your name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but because we lived on Gun Hill Road, if you went one stop, there was there was uh the stop was Pelham Parkway, Esplanade. There was a tunnel there where they would park the trains right. like for the um, you know, from like Friday to Monday. Right. So I mean it's like, you know, it's a gift. Uh -huh. We live one stop away. Uh -huh. so we can walk there. If you get chased, you can run right back home. Uh -huh. You know, you know. So they learned that tunnel. Uh -huh. so when I got older, that's the tunnel I used to go to. You know, the Pelham Parkway. If you went the other way, Baychester had the layup, uh -huh. and there'll be just one train in the middle. Right. So you would just get off Baychester, jump on the tracks, go down there, do your piece, uh -huh. and you know. You're how, done. how long would it take to do your piece? On the outside of the train? Uh, I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends. Talk a little louder. Somebody's uh, asking you to talk a little louder. Oh, it, it depends uh, on the person and what you're trying to accomplish. Right. If you're a lead, you know, and you want to do a whole cart, yeah. you're in there all night. All night. You know, uh, if you're a fade, in that era, just coming up, you know, you're there for an hour or two. Uh -huh. You know, do what you can, do your best, you know, because you always start out as a toy. Uh -huh. You don't start out on top, uh -huh. you know, so you got to go through levels. Right. When I got the art design, you know, I was tagging up Fade Street. Uh -huh. And dudes was like, yo, you can't tag up Fade. He's a, he's a legend. Mm. But my brother knew him. He came around the way, and I said, I want to be like that dude. Mm -hmm. I want to be like Phase 2. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was... Oh, so you phase took Phase 3. three. <laughs> oh, yeah, Phase 3. No harm, right? right no harm right. intended. But the quality of work I was putting out was garbage. Right. Art and Design told me. Uh -huh. It was like, man, you a toy. Mm -hmm. Knock it off. And mm -hmm. I was like, damn. Mm -hmm. So I said, I got to change my name. So I pretty much went home, cried first, mm -hmm. went home, <laughs> I was like going down the alphabet, P H A B E. If my name was Fabian, uh -huh. it would make sense. Right. I'd be dope. Like, oh shit, Fabian. You right. know? Went to C. My boy used to write F A C E, so I didn't want to take you his name. Face, right. Right. So I went to the P H A B E. And I was like, cool. I did the um, I did the pretty much the the hood Google search. Uh, you know, anybody know, anybody heard of Fade? Is yeah. there another Fade? Is there that? And there was no other Fade, so I was like, cool. Right. And I still wanted the two. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do like, like ODB. Right. You know, I'm going to be a bastard. No father to my style. So uh -huh. it's going to be like Fade 1 and Fade 2. Uh -huh. So there was, no, there was no predecessor, but I was tagging up Fade 2. Uh -huh. You know? Uh -huh. And um, started getting pretty good. You know, but now you ever had this happen where like you see your work and you see how other people view your work that you hit on like if you tag the outside of a train like you ever had that kind yeah. of thing? I've I've seen the effect. Mm -hmm. Um, 
people from my projects would be like, yo, I was on the way to school today and I seen something that similar to what you do in the building. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. And I'm like, yeah, that was me. Uh -huh. But they was like, but I couldn't read it. Uh -huh. So that's when I said to myself, you know what? I got to do something cleaner. Right. Like Freak doing the wild style. Right. You know? Because nobody can't read it. But wild style was developed so that the police couldn't read it. Uh -huh. But I said, nah, I need the people to read my name. Uh -huh. So I just started doing nice little block letters, clean, uh -huh. you know, and then my mother, she was like, I see. <laughs> Your mom saw it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just like what you're doing in the, you know what I was like, nah, it ain't yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, That's nah, the only nah. one I feared was my mom. I was like, man, look. I'm like, nope. So high school ends. Tell me about the beginning stages of what came to be known as Shirking. Like, how did well, that whole thing come I, I believe you? Shirkings was a, a, a natural evolution uh, of someone being on a train, a loving train, you know, and figuring out how to take it from the train and put it on to an army, mm -hmm. you know? And that came out of necessity. That came out of, you know, growing up and reading all these books, reading all these Donald Goins books and, you know, uh, learning about the last poets, you know, mm -hmm. learning, you know, uh, down these mean streets, you know, reading, I mean, reading all these different books that, that began to make up the, the character of the person, you know, and um, I said, I want, I want, I want to be great, you know, so I want to be great, and, and God put something in my hand, and it happened to just be, you know, a spray can. Mm -hmm. um, I was away at school. Uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. I went to New York Tech first, and then I transferred to um, Savannah. Wow, and I've heard of that school, Savannah yeah. College of Art and Design. Yeah. Wow, okay. A lot of uh, producers yeah. that live in Hollywood. Uh -huh. they, they told me throw that name around. Uh -huh. A lot of a lot of guys came there, and they're big time out there. Right, small school, but had carried big weight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I heard of that school. small school. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, a friend of mine, George, he put an airbrush in my hand. And I reluctantly was not answering his calls. And my mother said, answer his calls, see what he wants. I went over there and he was like, yo, I need to teach you this. You showed me how to paint on the trains. You know, so there again is that mentoring thing. You know, I mentored him and he gave me back a gift. And he set me up, gave me equipment, gave me everything. You know, and I, was, cause I kept giving him excuses. I don't want to do this. I'm good, you know. And eventually, I did my first couple of shirts. My mother bought the first shirt, right? I love mothers. Shout out to mothers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because moms was going to whip that ass if, if she, if you could yeah, yeah. cop to that train tag. Yeah. But she, yeah. she bought the shirt. She, she knew that was you anyway, though. I, how did he know? Yeah. She knew. <laughs> she knew. She knew what her baby boy. We always know. Yeah, yeah right. Y'all yeah. always know. Uh, well, you know, she wore it to work. What was that shirt? It was roses. It was roses, roses. that you airbrushed on, on a shirt. shirt. Yeah. On a t-shirt. On a t-shirt. Right. Yeah. And uh, she wore it to work. And people just went crazy. Mm -hmm. So now I'm doing jobs for people at her job. You know. And that's when, you know, she came back and gave me money. It was like, you know, like, what's this for? And she was like, you're going to have to buy t-shirts. You're going to have to read up on paint. Mm. You know, shout out to the mother. Yeah, yeah, and I followed it, mm. and I used to watch her do this organizational thing. So I started doing it. I would just like take my ruler, put lines, put everybody's name, how much down payment, blah blah blah. You know, I, I didn't know I was keeping books. You was keeping books, right? Yeah. That's what that is. Yeah, but the other side was telling me don't keep books, mm. keep it up here. Mm -hmm. So I had to try to keep it up here too. Mm -hmm. You know, remember Richard Pryor? Mm -hmm. He said, that boy's a genius. Mm -hmm. He said, he know all the numbers. He can write them down without a pen and a pad. Mm -hmm. You know, he keeps mm -hmm. it up here. Mm -hmm. But then he went crazy, though. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. lost everybody numbers. Money, right. All that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to have to go count the culture and uh -huh. write this down, you know. And uh, and then a family moved on the end of my block. They came from Harlem. Mm -hmm. It was like 10 of them. 10 
five boys, five girls, mm-hmm. you know, and they took to my work. Mm-hmm. And so that was like 10 sales right there. Plus all of them were in Harlem. They were all over the city because mm-hmm. they all played ball. The girls played ball, the boys played ball. So they was in tournaments, everything. Mm-hmm. So orders just started, started rolling in. And I said, man. So you man, doing, what are you doing for those shirts? Roses still, or are you like? I'm doing like basketball with hands, mm-hmm. um, doing graffiti. So names. this is customization. Yeah, basically. This is custom. it. Like this, you're yeah. customizing yeah. the shirts. Yeah, and paying paying attention to to uh, the fabric too. Uh-huh. You know, because people will be like, "Hey, can you get this kind?" Uh-huh. You know, and uh, so I ventured out to Harlem and started doing stuff in Harlem. This is like two years prior to Shirt King. Shirt King, right? Yeah, this is kind of like laying out the foundation. Uh-huh. And I ran into one of my other high school buddies, and um, his name was. Uh, Dow Ferguson, mm-hmm. and they called him D. Ferg. Yeah, and uh, he was like, "Yo, I'm doing shirts too." Mm-hmm. He said, "I got this from you and Nike." Mm-hmm. He was doing acrylic because we were doing acrylic, mm-hmm. you know, jackets and pants and stuff. I was the only one doing acrylic graffiti on the pants. Mm-hmm. Nike was doing it like on his, his book bag and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And Dow said he was watching, mm-hmm. so he's blowing up in Harlem doing. The Benzes mm-hmm. with the Bulldogs and stuff. So we we partnered for about six months. And what I like about that was that he never hid anything from me as far as like, come on, let's go to the Lancy Street. Let's go to Essex. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna introduce you to the Eisner brothers, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And then I got on to the Russells. The Russell T. Yeah, oh right. man, well the sweats. The sweats. Oh my goodness. That, that <laughs> white sweat and the, the cotton to feel, you know? I was like, woo wee. Right. You know? So for those who don't know, Daryl Ferguson, D. Ferg, is the father of ASAP Ferg. And D. Ferg wound up doing like the Bad Boy logo and like he yes. did a lot in the culture. Yes, uptown but he said that he learned a lot from, from you and Knight. Knight. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So it kind of like trickles down because mm-hmm. we learned from Deck, mm-hmm. right? He graduated and we took what we can get from him. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then the island came the next year, mm-hmm. you know, and he got what he can get from us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So from there, that was the one who said, you, I think you, you got to go in a different direction. Uh-huh. Like you need to go find your two homies from art and design, the one from Queens and the one from Brooklyn. Because uh-huh. I think y'all would be good together. Dow actually said that. Mm-hmm. And I had no thoughts of it at all. And then I was like, you know what, you're right. Wow, D. Ferguson the one that put that mm-hmm. that battery in your back. The first. Yeah, the first one. The yeah. first. Uh-huh. So I went to Marcy, I couldn't find Knight. And Knight's mother gave me the phone number and I ended up going to uh, to uh, to South Side Jamaica, Queens, uh-huh. and hooking up with Kashim, showed him how to airbrush, and then he's telling me, yo, I know Jam Master J. Uh-huh. I'm like, all right, cool, let's go over there. He said, yo, I'm setting it up for next week. So here we are, like, two 18, 19-year-old kids, uh-huh. we going up to Jam Master J crib. This is 85. They on top of the free right. chain right yeah. now. They you all know? run DMCs. <laughs> The, the, the epitome of yeah. the epitome, right? You know, and Jay opens the door and he was like, Oh, shit, yo, Kyle, what up? I was like, Damn, you really do know him, you know. <laughs> but then Jay, you know, he's originally from Brooklyn, so then he just did the turnaround. I was like, Yo, who your man? Right, <laughs> right. He got real serious. I was right. like, God, me, you know, right. he's like, check me quick, like, Yo, who's your man, you know, right? He's like, Man, it's fate, you know. Came here to show you something. I uh, open up the bag. Uh, you know, Jay is like, what you got in the bag there, you right. know? Like Jay was always like, you know. So pulled out two shirts. He was like, oh my goodness. What were the two shirts? Uh, I had drew. It was a black Russell's, you know, long sleeve, and I had hand painted a gold chain around the around the neck. Right. Yeah, and then the other one was like some airbrush, you know, like a Cuban link type. It was just a, a bubble. Like you know, a bubble link, right. Okay. Yeah, the old school, you yeah. know. But it was on the black and the hand painted it, and then the other one was airbrush. And then he was like, yo, Kyle, yo, you down with this? And Kyle was like, yeah. And he was like, yo, get down with this, and I'll give you your money and go to the Ave. Mm-hmm. And 
I was like, wow. But um, we didn't we didn't really need Jay's money because Uptown was treating me real good. Cause you was getting it. Yeah. At yep. this point, give me a sense of like in a week, like how much you was getting from Uptown. Well, I could tell you the first time I got money up there, there was a a, a brother. He's a he's a prophet now. Um, my boy Black. Mm -hmm. And Black was hustling at the time. And, you know, I always made it a, a my point to stay away from anybody selling drugs and stuff like that. You know, because I seen the way it was going. Right. You know, you know? So I was like, you know, he kept saying, yo, I need one of your shirts. But I was like, I don't want nobody like you representing what I do. Which is wild at the time because the money was flowing. Right. Like, the crazy. money like, was all yeah. over. Right. Yeah. 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 And eventually, you know, it's my boy. I did a shirt for him, and he wore it when he went to re up. Mm -hmm. He would go to Harlem to re up, mm -hmm. and he was like, "Yo, the guy there, he saw the shirt. Mm -hmm. He said, come down." I said, "Damn, I didn't even want to open this door, man. Now the the, the head guy downtown <laughs> now to connect me. wants a shirt. Wants to see me. <laughs> you know? I'm like, ah, oh, man. I'm like, come on, bro." <laughs> I just finished reading That's like funny. Kenyatta's last escape. Right. right. You know, you all read the going. Yeah, I'm reading all that, man. I don't want no involvement, you know, I don't want none of this, you know. <laughs> and um, so eventually I went down there and I got exposed to the money. Mm -hmm. You know, but I also got exposed to watching the beginnings of the demise of our communities. Mm -hmm. Cause I saw lawyers on that line, I saw mm -hmm. firemen, mm -hmm. doctors. Nurses, it was, and they was regular people, but they was all saying like it's a rich man's high. Mm -hmm. So I kind of understood why the police would just go through the block, wouldn't even mess with them, mm -hmm. you know, because these was people prominent with money, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. lawyers, doctors, you know, but in but a month online, online around the corner. Right. So um, me and Black skipped the line, went all the way to the front. He was like, yo, Black, what's up? Yo, what do you do with the shirt? He's like, that's him. And yo, it was like a little, a little dude, you know, like 15, 16 years old. And he was just pitching, serving, throwing the money behind him, pitching, serving, throwing the money behind him. And I seen the pile of money like up to the ceiling. Mm. And I was like, man. So mind you, my mother's price was five dollars, right? right? Then it went to ten. Right. Then the family from Harlem came, it was fifteen. Right. Right? Then I went down, it was like twenty-five. Facts. Okay? Right. <laughs> right. No, right. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we with the man. Right. Now you with the plug. You got yeah. the 40, 50. Exactly. Right. Like, yes. like how much? And he said, I need like 12 shirts. So I wrote them down. You know, I only think I did write them down. But at first, I was trying to memorize it because mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm in the game. I'm around people who invented the game. This is Harlem. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do the Harlem thing to memorize, like, mm -hmm. okay, Jackie, Frank, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, you don't mind if I write this down? He's like, right. man, right. do you? Right. I'm like, okay, cool. And then he was like, take the down payment from there. Just grab whatever. Just grab from the. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at like about seven hundred dollars. We're like, okay, your balance is whatever, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, I served them in about two weeks. Came back, mm -hmm. loved it, and that was the beginning. Right, you know, of getting was, money. Yeah, of getting, yeah, getting the money and giving me the confidence. Right. Know? So just to kind of keep a timeline in order, this is like eighty five. That's eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had a space where. Hip hop is really at still 1.0. You got Run DMC as a super group at yeah. the time. Yeah. And you connected the dots with yeah. Jay. Mm -hmm. But also, we're right at the precipice of the crack e epidemic. Right, right. Which produced the golden era of hip hop. Right. 86 came. 86, out. right. And it was like perfect timing because we opened up in 86. So tell me about that. You guys opened up at the Coliseum Mall. Yeah, uh, after Jay, you know, put the battery in me and Kashi's back, we went to the Ave, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the Ave, me and Dean and uh, Lee just standing on two fifth, you know, we were right. at Ave, all it's like, it's pounding in my head. Right. So it's like, yo, we gotta find a spot. So we went to a couple of little flea market spots and everything, you know, 
I think um, one of Kashim's friends told us about the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. They were like, y'all need to be in there. And we went in there and signed up. And the first day we opened up, somehow Kashim got in contact with Knight mm -hmm. and he came. Mm -hmm. But he hand painted for like a year before he picked up the airbrush. Mm -hmm. So he was still doing acrylic mm -hmm. and hand painting and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, my man Chase was there. Uh, this kid named Puffy was there. His sister Lisa was there. And uh, my boyfriend Dave ended up coming. And Dave ended up being, he ended up coming from out the streets mm -hmm. and started filming later on. You know, he started filming for us later on. So stuff. filming content. Filming content. Of you guys working on shirts yeah. and stuff yeah. in 85, 86. Uh, this was, he was still hustling, but then a year, couple of years later. Do you have that content? Uh, um, Dave has it, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. He's working on something now uh, with the content. Dope, know? dope. So you, you, you bust a move to Coliseum. Mm -hmm. The goal is to sell customized t-shirts. And hoodies. I think I think it was bigger because yeah. tell me. Because personally, you know, I brought Eddie Gold Caps in there. Mm -hmm. He was down down the block somewhere, and I was like, "Yo, you need to move into the Coliseum." Mm -hmm. You know, then uh, Eric and Barry, who you know eventually became Shabazz Brothers. Barry, you know, was like, "Yo, you need to come here too." And then Bell was over here on Nostrum. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody remembers, but he was the, the Brooklyn Dapper Dan. Mm. Yeah, and he he was on Nostrum and where? Nostrum and um, um, Atlantic. Oh, he was right by where Murray's Corner is. He was, like Murray's is right here. Right. He was in that building right there. He was right in there. that right there. Yeah, the gray door. I lived right around the corner. I'm trying to think. Oh, I mean, was, it's, it's before. Like I was, like I said, I was on the porch still. I was on the stoop still. Yeah, he's actually the creator of the, that Nike suit. You know, oh. yeah, and that perfected it. You know, but Bell, because it was a request thing. Can uh -huh. you do this? Can you uh -huh. do that? You uh -huh. know, and Bell did it. Oh, uh -huh. um, okay. He was nice. He was the Godfather. Right. Mm -hmm. Now let me just let me just and because again I want to be authentic to the timeline. Mm -hmm. Dude used to get tailor made. Right? Mm -hmm. I remember like my uncles used to get tailor made. Mm -hmm. Y'all going to get my tailor made. Mm -hmm. Tailor made were what exactly? Tailor made was something personalized. Customization. Customization. Right. Yeah. Which was you could really only find on, on Essex Street, you know? We yeah. call it Delancey Street. Delancey Street, but it was really Essex, yeah. right? Yeah. So customization at this time was a thing. Like it wasn't, even though you guys were customizing shirts and hoodies and pants mm -hmm. or whatever, you guys were part of a network, so to speak, mm -hmm. of customization. Well, it's, it's just understanding the, the um, or uh, really exploring and understanding the height of having your own, you know, and seeing the reaction. When I used to go with my older cousins to the Lancy Street, you know, I seen the power in it. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, I need, yo, I need the crown mm -hmm. upside down. I need you to point it the cane, and we go back next week. And that shit is done. Right, right. He's the only one with it. He's one of one. Yeah, one of one. Nobody knows. And that was very one. hip hop back then. That was very hip hop. I got this shit. Like, I, I remember even like, you ain't want somebody to wear the same shirt as you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you got the same shirt I bought, yeah. like. Yeah. So everything was about, in hip hop at the time, was about this self style of wisdom. Like, this yeah. is me. Yeah. yeah. Down to what I wear. Yeah, it was power in that. Mm -hmm. It was power in that. I mean, even to a story uh, that I've heard growing up, that the guy who kind of created the Brooklyn style was from Marcy, uh -huh. right? Eric Tweedy. Uh -huh. and, they, and everybody that says that he's the first. They say, get the candles, I heard that name. tilt them right. to the side. Leather gloves with the zippers, you know what I'm saying? Quarter feel and could fight real good, you know? Right. So and, and I guess also the wallabies. The wallabies. So that was you know, that was the like wow. And right. everybody followed suit because it was a a, a a picture of power. Right. And Run DMC adopted that. Right. Later, right? 
They came with the Kango, the Kazelle, the, the, the Leather, the Mama, right. Adidas. And Adidas, right. You know? Right, even the gloves. Run will rock the gloves sometimes. Yeah, right. Yeah. But that's 77, 78 Brooklyn. They did it in 83 on, you know? Because we tend to abandon our styles and move on because we are creatives. Right. So we don't want to wear what we had last year. So right. We, we are constantly evolving yeah. in our creative style. Yeah. That's what Black Folk does. Yeah. So you get the store, you guys are set up. Biz was your first customer? What Biz was your first hip hop customer? Biz says that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, Rest in peace, I, Biz. RIP to the GOAT. But um I'm I'm believing that he 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 could have been. Uh-huh. He could have been, but he wasn't as big. Uh-huh. So sometimes that gets kind of lost in the hip hop right. closet. Well, really, it sounds like, <laughs> like, that, like that. it sounds like Jay was your first hip hop sell. Yeah, Jay definitely. I mean, for the record, it was actually uh, um, Larry Love from Larry um, Love. Yeah, from oh, Grandmaster oh, Flash. Oh, Larry. Right. Yeah. Oh. Larry Love. I'm saying, if the name, listen, if you're a certain age, <laughs> you feel how I feel. If you're younger, I get it. Yeah, but, yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. It was Larry. Larry but Love. as far as the Coliseum, to my knowledge, the biggest besides Biz, well, after Biz came Kane and then LL. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we saw LL with Mad Shirt Kings. Yeah. Shit. yeah. And when he, he came because Jay used to wear his to the office. Uh-huh. I think they were at 298 Elizabeth Street, uh-huh. right? And Jay wouldn't tell nobody where he got it from. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I'm like, come on, bro. Like, uh-huh. What's the purpose? Thing? Right, you right. Know? So, but that was also hip hop. Like, I didn't want you to have the shit that I had. It's what like, we deal with all the time. Right, right, like, yeah. yeah. Like, like, I, I don't want to put you on. Like, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, right. I don't want to put you on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's hip hop. I can respect it. So, at the height of Shirt Kings in the Coliseum, mm-hmm. how many customers were you dealing with a week? Wow. Because, and I'm asking you this, let me ask you, let me tell you why I'm asking you this. Because this is customization. It's not like you have 50 white t-shirts and people are buying white tees. Uh, Everything that people are buying, you guys are designing. And people may say, yo, I want you to put Takesha on a shirt in a name belt. Or somebody may say, yo, I want you to put my block Pacific Street. Mm -hmm. So what was your capacity is what I'm trying to find out. I I can say between... 20 to 35 a day. 20 to 35 a day? Yeah. Wow. Because you would have us three working, the three main guys, right? But then you would have people, you know, like Chase who would help fill the golden. Uh Uh-huh. You know, then we hired Nate. You know, Nate was our first hire. And that was a a power move because Nate was in high, still in high school. Right. But he's the guy that got kicked out of five different high schools. Right. So he knew. He knew everybody. Everybody. <laughs> he knew everybody. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, I just, oh, just, I, let's put a pin in that just for a minute because I want to talk about something that Kai, we was talking about offline, is this idea of the New York City high school system when you was traveling and experiencing New York City. For those of us who traveled to school, who went to specialized high schools, Therein lies the nape of creativity in the culture. Oh, definitely. So when you talk about a tech or art and design or music and art or LaGuardia, you talk about you're talking about the birthplace of hip hop legends. Yeah. So this cat that went to five different high schools, this cat knew everybody in the city. Yes. Yes. Right. He went to Hillcrest. He went to all this <laughs> one. You know? He and went. he will pull a little bit of knowledge right. from oh, everyone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nah, people don't understand how valuable that is. Look, so people that live out of New York State, right? If you if you live, say you live in Germantown, Maryland, you go to Germantown High School, right? Right? You don't leave your community, right, right. but in New York, especially in the eighties, 
Jazz. Philly, right, right. And But in the 80s in New York City, we was moving around the entire city as 15, 16 year olds because yeah. we had to go to school. Yeah, yeah. And there was a, a certain degree of fear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I was able to break that fear because as a graffiti artist, that took me to every barrel. Mm -hmm. And the team, you know, that I had was TNT. And TNT was like a, a, a barrel-wide team of right. graffiti artists. So I had friends in Queens. Right. Only because Kashim used to bring me to Queens early. Right. So I had no fear to go there now. Right. You know, right. Deck was bringing me back to Brooklyn. Right. So I was like, all right, cool. So the graffiti pretty much unified, you know, all the different cats, but the school system really unified guys that came from Long Island and right. Jersey, Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, you know, like, and so we got to see each other's culture. And like you said, there was contrast in that. Oh, so definitely. Brooklyn dudes didn't rock like Uptown dudes, didn't rock like Queens dudes, didn't yeah. rock like Bronx yeah. dudes. Damn rock like Staten Island cats. So yeah. there was a contrast and it became a pool that you were able to draw from. Yeah, definitely. What was the most you were charging for shirts back then? Uh, then we started out the gate 50 bucks for right. shirt and we right. pretty much maintained that. So you, 50 you was know, kind 50, of the base. 50 was the base and then right. once you start getting into the sleeves and right. the back. And, right, bells and whistles, you, know, you yeah. would add more. Yeah. So, Math Hopper episode of My Expert Opinion, Clark Kent is talking and he's discussing his introduction to Jay-Z and jazz. And he mentions looking for Jay-Z, he couldn't find Jay-Z. And he says, you know, I call Fade from Shirt Kings hmm. and I said, yo, where was Jay? And you was able to find Jay for Tell me about the relationship you had with Jay-Z early on. Um, I know Nike's from his building, but kind of give us a sense of, because again, we're talking about early hip hop. This is hip hop. Oh yeah, definitely. Right? definitely. So kind of give me a sense of that. It, it, it was more of a, you know, when I started going out to Marcy, you know, hanging out with Nike. I was already intrigued by what Nike was doing, painting in the building. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. we weren't allowed to paint in the building in uh -huh. the Bronx, uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. So I'm like, wow, this is different. Uh -huh. And then, you know, he's introducing me to the whole team and everybody was a creative, you know? Uh -huh. you, you had Johnny, Johnny, who lived, he lived on the fifth floor, you know, next to Jay. He was the, the, the DJ for Marcy, you know, uh -huh. beside, Frankie D, you know, mm -hmm. from the Marcy, right? Frankie D from the Marcy. Mm -hmm. And so Johnny was that dude, mm -hmm. you know? And then then you had, you know, other characters, and you had Crew, he went to uh, Music and Art. An amazing artist, mm -hmm. amazing artist. Fortunately, he, he died young, you know? Um, and then you had Jazz O, mm -hmm. he would come through. So I'm like, man, like, you know, you, you got the hub right here, mm -hmm. you know? So coming with the Uptown mind, I kind of seen like what was missing, mm -hmm. you know, and always saw that what they were doing in Brooklyn needs to be exposed, mm -hmm. you know? Just like how I felt what I was doing Uptown needed to be exposed, you mm -hmm. know, to the world, to the masses, because I knew there was something going on between our people and this culture, you know? So when I met Jay, you know, he would be around because of night and he was definitely different. And I always thought he was our age. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was maybe three, four years younger, mm -hmm. but he had a maturity, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and uh, I don't know, when you, when you say you can see a special kid, like he was kind of like a special kid. You know, I saw it. I know he knew it. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was always cocky and confident. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think the turning point in in all of our relationships is when Jazz pretty much gave up. Mm -hmm. You know, he got a deal, and the deal didn't treat him well. Mm -hmm. 
and he had a change in his life and yeah. he left that alone. Right. But I come from a background where if you're the superstar of the projects, mm -hmm. we're gonna help you make it. You have to make you it. You have to make it. Cause you're our ticket out. Right. And I don't think he saw that. Right. And Jazz actually, it's funny that you mentioned that, babe, because Jazz says that. Mm -hmm. He says that that deal disenfranchised him at the time. He was, you know, dealing with all this stuff and he he kind of gave up. But he was our hope. Right. He was our And we love Jazzo. Yes. I'm telling you, growing up, yes. we yes. love Jazzo. Yes. But he broke our hearts. Uh, and the result was, I believe Jay went into the streets. Uh, Heartbroken. Uh, you know, we disbanded. Uh, you know, the band disbanded. Right. The band broke up. The band right. broke up. Right, you know? the lead singer left, the band broke yeah. up. <laughs> Basically. And uh and it affected all of us. Yeah. Um but I always, you know, when I heard Jay, I was like, man, this dude has something, yeah. you know. And uh I introduced him to Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. Kane speaks about it in Drink Champs, mm -hmm. but he said shirt King dude, so mm -hmm. I'm dude. Just whatever, right? Yeah, we, we respect that Kane. Definitely. That's my dog. And, uh, you know, I kept telling him, yo, there's this dude I need you to meet. Like, he, he got it. Uh, he got it. And then the connection was the best style. You know, right. hearing best style, best style. Right. You know, and here, I'm like, y'all should already know. Right, because Kane was right on Lewis Ave. He right. wasn't far. Right, he wasn't far, but mm -hmm. far enough, far not, enough to to not to have really know these guys. Right. right. You know? And so you introduced Jay Z to Kane? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and um, we set up a, a a date to do a a tape, you know, and it was supposed to be a battle or whatever, and it basically turned into Kane saying, "Yo, who's that dude?" Mm -hmm. You know, and they developed a friendship from there. You know, and Kane tried to shop him, you know, and uh. Yeah, yeah, it was the thing. I wanted Kane to try to get Jazz O on with the Juice Crew. Right. That's what it was. Right. You know, and you know, he you know, they at that time it was like Batman that would have been Robinson. crazy. Yeah. Jazz you said you was trying to get Kane to put Jazz O on the Juice Crew. Yeah. That would have been crazy. Yeah. That would have yeah. been wild. It would have been legendary. That would have been legendary. You know, legendary moments. Yeah. That, that passed legendary. us. Yeah. But you were there. Definitely, it is yeah. documented. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, we made a tape, yeah. and uh, Fresh Gordon has the still has the original. And this is when I knew that that Jay and Jazz were superstars because they were doing a take, and they came messed up. It was like, yo, let's start this again. And Jazz and Jay Z would say totally different rhymes off the top of their head. On the second tape. On the second tape. Mm. Great. Like, what happened to the. And I'm like, oh my God, what are they saying? Great. It was like. Great. I said, oh my God. Did you know, like, tell me a time when you was like, oh shit, I'm amongst greatness. Like, I'm in a space right now of greatness, right? And it could even been your situation. Like, you could have been in a situation where you was like, wow, like. The, I'm doing great shit right now. The reason, the reason I knew it was greatness because the things I used to see Jazz and Jay Z do, I saw that in a basement with the Funky Four Plus One, mm. and they lived not too far. They used to go to DJ Breakout's house, and Breakout lived on Boston Road. Mm -hmm. So Raheem, when Raheem joined them, you know it was Funky Four Plus, Plus One. One, right? All right. And I seen Raheem drilling them, like the Temptations. They were in sync, spinning around. Boom, he's like, yo, sing it like this. They was warming up, singing songs. And so here I am years later in Brooklyn, and I'm watching Jazz O and Jay, and they singing. Mm. Warming up, doing that, you know, all that. <laughs> so I said, Grandmaster Flash is great. Right. The, the MF is gonna be great right here. Great. I've never seen that 
You know, like right. what rapper even today like practices right. singing like uh, uh, and all of that notes you know? and shit. notes and listening to the greats. Mm. Cause stuff like the ain't no nigga song and all that. These are the songs that we were listening to, you know. Mm. But this is songs that they were singing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, man, these dudes are destined for greatness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Spring of 1992, Kai, me, we seniors at Brooklyn Tech. Our senior trip was to Daytona. Well, it was to Florida, but we went to Orlando. We went to Daytona. Mm. The first two days we was at Disney World. Day one, we Brooklyn kids, first and foremost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So day one, we realized that in the gift shops, there wasn't no security. And we start stealing everything. Okay. At not we, you, Allegedly. not me. Yeah. Uh, right. I, 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 the statute of limitations is so far. There. I wasn't yeah. even there. <laughs> right. So we start stealing everything, right? We stealing so much shit that we are buying lockers in the Disney World to put stolen shit in the lockers. <laughs> so we did that. The second day, we ain't even going no rides. We just stealing shit, right? Yeah. I'm not going to mention my man because I'm not snitching on nobody. But one of my men <laughs> yeah. stole a, t uh, a jean jacket, a Disney wow. jean jacket, right? Let me tell you what it had on the back. It was an airbrush Mickey on the back. With the words Disney written like graffiti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the spring of 1992. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because my question to you is the run that Shirt Kings had, at what point did you start to see that the work that you were doing was hitting mainstream and people were replicating that shit? Because I can tell you that shit was a replica of your work. Oh, right, right. Absolutely. And this was May of 92. Um, we were flattered, you know, and kind of honored that somebody is taking a look at us, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, you always still uh, want that stamp of approval. Right. Imitation is the sincerest form. Yeah. So when you hear about it, people are like, yo, they copying your stuff. And you know, like, all right, cool. You know, mm -hmm. we never thought that we would ever do anything with Disney, even though that was a, a dream job for me. Right. You know, but now here it is, Disney taking from us. Facts. <laughs> Facts, know? without question. Yeah, but the thing is, is that we were using their stuff and they never came to bother us. They never hit you with licensing. Right. Right. They just used us as, you know, like, oh, wow, this is what's happening. This is what's, what's possible in yeah. the marketplace. Yeah. Let us throw Mickey on so a jean jacket. We was basically stealing from each other. Facts. Right. Facts. <laughs> Facts. Right. You right. know? Right. But we can turn around and say, hey, that's our style. Right. The, the graffiti. Right. You know? Oh, it was undeniably right. your style. Definitely. Yeah, it was undeniable. I know it was, but um, I, I recently did a uh, collab with Disney. Nice. You know, nice. it was not recent, but maybe about four years ago. Uh, uh, it was uh, when Star Wars was about to be launched. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they owned the Star Wars franchise. Yes, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, an agency called me up that worked for, for George. And um, they pretty much commissioned four designs for me. You know, Yoda, Stormtrooper, uh, Darth Vader, and... Uh, somebody else but mm -hmm. um and it was a, a collab where urban outfit is so you know did pretty well nice. and you know i was like you know in the meeting i was like yo can i get my name put on a shirt because nobody's gonna believe that i did it and they said nah, we're, then we don't do that we don't right. feature artists right. but we'll do you one better on the hang tag we'll put your name there but when I saw the hand tag, I seen my name, my logo, then I seen Star Wars, Disney, and then the New York City was there and the Death Star over New York City. Mm. So they went in and mm -hmm. actually designed something catered to, you know, what they felt, you know, was part of my journey. Mm. You know? That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. When did it end for Shirt Kings? It hasn't ended. Never ended. No, it's uh, it's kind of like the band disbanded. Right. 
You know, everybody right. went different directions. So let me ask a different question. When did the Coliseum Mall store stop to exist? When did that end? Mm, 96. Okay, so you guys were in the Coliseum Mall during the Nas era? Yeah. During the yeah. Biggie era? Yeah. Yeah. I seen a See, joint where Heavy D had a banging. That shit. The, uh, did you ever think Ice? Yes. Did you ever? That's what I asked you. Did you ever think Iceberg kind of took from y'all style? Oh, definitely. Cause that heavy shit, that Flintstone shit, yeah. that shit looked like yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, Iceberg. You you gotta remember there were there were guys who were in the Coliseum at the time and and end up getting corporate jobs for. You know, so organizations, yeah, right, and corporations. So they it just made sense. Knowledge. Yeah, they brought the knowledge. You know, uh, Lot Twenty Nine. You know, they had the. Uh, you know, but see, these guys had access to licensing. Right. We didn't know anything. We didn't about have it. access to licensing. Yes. Yeah. I attempt at a licensing agency when I was like nineteen years old, oh, and wow. it was the first time that I ever saw that process, mm -hmm. like The Simpsons. Yeah. So I, the company I worked for was responsible for the licensing of Bart Simpson, Homer wow. Simpson. And so they had like the different looks. Yeah. So it wasn't even like just Bart. Mm -hmm. It was like Bart standing like this or yeah. Bart standing like yeah. this. So that was the first time I had ever come across the intri intricate nature of licensing. And I'm not an artist. I don't give a fuck about that shit. Right. But right. but it was it was eye opening. Yeah. And Bart borrowed, you know, you got Bart with the spray can. Right. You know, they got Bart uh, with the Jordan suit on, you right, know, airbrush, right. you know, different different styles and stuff, you mm -hmm. know. I'm, I'm definitely part of the the making of the, the Black Bart, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely a creator of that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know. What do you think the legacy of Shirt Kings is? The legacy is... Inner city youth coming from impoverished areas in the city, right? And also three different styles. Like, you know, this is a guy from Queens, Southside Queens, right? Jamaica. A guy from not just Brooklyn, from Marcy, right? And then another guy from Brooklyn. But really lived all over. <laughs> lived all over, but right. growing up in the Bronx around the inception of, of hip hop. Right. You know, you mix that all up in a bowl together, you know, that's that's pretty much unheard of. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, three different dress codes coming together, mm -hmm. you know, three three different mentalities coming together, mm -hmm. you know, but having unification under one banner of art, right? And then, you know, the, the, the militantism is like working for yourself. You know, we are finally figuring out how to be an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, at a young age. Right. You know, we like 17, 18, 19, figuring this thing out, mm -hmm. you know. And by 22, we're solidified in the culture as the first outfitters of hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, people will come and get a, a full outfit from us and then wear it in a video, wear it on stage, you know? Um, so the legacy is, is basically believing in the gift that God has given you, you know, whether it be the gift of gab, whether it be the gift of, of, of learning, whether it be the gift of mastering 10 different languages, you know, like it, it's all hip hop. Right. It all works together, right. you know, and we're, we're pushing this culture right. for us visually. Right. You know, we're the visual aspect of, of the culture. I wanted to ask you this, at what point did you realize that this culture would feed and nurture your lifestyle? I saw it as a kid. Uh, you knew it as a kid. I knew it wholeheartedly. You know, we had people like Grandmaster Brother Mel doing songs. And in Beat Street, you know, he turns around and he says, you know, after this, there'll be no more, you know, no more pain, no more crying, no more shame, just movies, museums, and a Hall of Fame. 
And that woke me up. I said, movies, museums, and the Hall of Fame? What is he talking about? And I said, wait, I'm on a set of BET. I was there taking pictures. So I'm like, okay, this is a movie. It's a movie, right. Museum? I don't know about a museum. It's coming. I, like, it's coming. It's coming. I got a call with Nikki and Ralph tomorrow. Yeah. Shout out to Nikki and Ralph McDaniels. And now we got the yeah. museum. We got the museum. And then we got to have the Hall of Fame. We got the right. Baseball Hall of Fame. We got right. the Basketball Hall of Fame. We got to have the Hip Hop Hall of Fame. Right. You know? Damn, he was prophetic. Yeah, he was prophetic. So you that. knew then that this thing would feed your lifestyle. Yeah, because he woke me up. Melly Mel and Kumo D. Kumo D said some intricate stuff too. Um, he uh, uh, it was the record Turn It Up, right? And he was like, just like a force driven by ancient spirits, feel it, hear it, a metaphor for a living bass amplified when fully applied. All adversaries become terrified because I take rhymes and he decode them, he wrote them, and I was like, What? what? Are these words? <laughs> what? And he's the first time I heard the word, he said, Because I'm an entrepreneur. That's the first time you heard the word entrepreneur. Yes. entrepreneur. And he said, because cool I'm more style of metaphors. Mm. And I said, entrepreneur. I went to the dictionary and I said, it has to be a very important word. Because he also mm. said about computers. Mm. There wasn't no computers in 84 that mm. we knew of. Mm. But he said something about a computer. And I was like, wait a minute, what is he talking about? So I looked up the word entrepreneur and I said, that's what I want to be. Mm. That's crazy. That's what I want. Kai, you heard that? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. I want to get, before we get into, I, I saw my sister Jai note, so I know she got shit on deck. But okay. before we get to that, I just want to get into your present life. Where do you live, Kai? I'm in Los Angeles. So you out in Cali? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and what, what, what do you do? Like, what's your day-to-day -day life? Well, uh, I've been there 18 years. Uh-huh. You've uh, been in Cali for 18 years? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It went by fast, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I got there because of uh, Raven Simone. What you were doing with Raven? I seen her here in New York, and she was doing a book signing or, or, or it was her first CD or something, and I went up there like a fan because mm -hmm. I knew she was hot. My nieces and nephews was watching her on TV. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, let me try the old Shirt King thing. I, mean, I did a shirt for her. I waited online for three hours, bought her CD. And I got up there, I, I handed her the shirt. Right. And and she was just like signing, like she was like real like bored and stuff. When I gave her the shirt, she lit up. Right. And she almost was acting like the TV show. She was like bugging out, right? you know, dancing around. I was like, oh my God, you got, I was like, I got something for you. What was the shirt? I did, I did her face on there. On the shirt, okay. Yeah, and a lot of times when people meet celebs, it's like they're trying to get knowledge from them. They're trying to drain them for something. Nobody right. wants to Nobody give them wants anything. To give them anything. Yeah. So I, I always use that. You got to get, if you give, they're gonna, yeah. you're going to open that door. And so it opened up a door to where I'm at now. So you gave her the shirt and what? She was like, yo, come to Cali? <laughs> Basically, she was like, let me introduce you to my dad, my manager. And I was like, your dad, yo, you too young for me. I ain't trying to <laughs> She was like, no, no, he's my manager. You know, she's like, you're so silly, you know, like that. And uh, her stylist at the time, you know, I had my little book and was showing. She was like, come behind the table. She was like, go over there. So right. VIP access, right? right? So again, now you behind the rope. I'm behind, yeah. Now you can get busy. Right. right, so I'm showing him the book, and the stylist is like, hold up, you're fading? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, back in the days where um, Belva DeVoe, I, I was the one that was cutting your checks. Ooh, because you did all Belva DeVoe shit. Yeah, that was an experience, right. a big experience, you right. know, meeting Michael Bibb and, right. you know, just connecting with him, and, right. you know, to this day, we talk and, you know, right. we do some things, right. you know, here and there. Right. And she was like, move the county. Mm. Wow. Yeah. She said, you see the reaction, come out there. So I went out there for confirmation. I had met I met this producer online too. You know, I think it was uh prospects back then. Right. And I read his profile and his profile kept popping up with all these people. And I was like, I don't know who this dude. I clicked, I seen he was a producer and he made um hustle and flow. Mm. So I hit him up and I was like, yo, I got a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So 
that was like the second confirmation. He was like, yo, when you come out here, come to Universal Studios and come see me. Mm -hmm. I went out there, I went to see him, and I did uh, some stuff for Raven, and came back to New York, packed up, and was out. Oh, yeah. You've been out there ever since. Yeah, since 05. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we spoke about mentorship before, and it's kind of like when you are gifted this type of experience, life-wise, career-wise, professional-wise, personal-wise, it's almost a requirement that you kind of spread that and give that. You have to. Yeah, yeah. You have to, or you'll you'll implode. Right. You know, you right. have to give the gift away. Right. You know, whether it's information, knowledge, um connections like there's no way that you cannot help you know a younger brand right you know i've aligned myself with some of the most powerful underground brands that all of them have the potential to take over you know like like john ross from seventh heaven you know um stephen barter from barriers uh of course, Ian Connor, you know, uh, you know, he has his brand Sicko, uh, Strawberry Mansion, where you know, with Luke, uh, like these guys are like up next. You know, they're all young, they're hungry, they're connecting, they're traveling all over the world. You know, they're going to Africa, they're going to Japan, they, you know, because they, fashion now has a global. Yes. Form. Yes. Right. Once what we created here has right it, it has appeal yes. in the world yes it does right. and, and it's very powerful and I think other cultures are recognizing that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so they're they're inviting like mm -hmm. come come to our country and, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. let's, let's break bread together where's the other shirt came where's Nike at uh, Nike is mm -hmm. in Long Island he's doing tattoos uh -huh. you know. Um, needs to come out of that <laughs> right. and do the gift that God gave him, you know? Right. Because right. with that comes all the respect and the accolades and, you know, you're a legend. Right. You're a legend. He's a legend. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, well, I'm a rap legend, but I'm working at the car wash. Right. Like, just living your purpose. Yeah, you got to live your purpose, bro. Uh -huh. All the time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, Kashim, he passed away. He passed away. I, and I was going to ask you that. You were you were around a lot of legends and movers in this game that have passed away. We talk a lot about how hip hop legends don't grow old, right? We in a we in a culture where the average age of death for black men is like eight. You know what I'm saying? In hip hop is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. You've lived around some legends that have passed away. How does that affect you? Like, like, when, like, do you do you ever think about that? Like, wow, this brother's gone. Like, you mentioned one dude that was a DJ that died young. You know, we yeah. know Jam Master J is gone. Yeah, Hashim is gone. Yeah, you know who? Um, uh, Ecstasy. Ecstasy is gone. You know, John uh, Word. John uh, passed Mark away. Morales, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, Buffy. Yeah, a lot of these cats are gone, and they were part of the foundation of the culture that we now I find I find myself, you know, like I was I was saying to myself, you know, with True Boy, I was like, man, I'm not gonna cry. Mm. And then one day I'm just driving around and just like, oh yeah, that, that hurt me. Because yeah. you have relationships with these guys, right. you know, like we were all in the trenches. Right. right. Like before the money. At one point, Shirt Kings was getting more money than the recording artists. Right, y'all was getting more money than rappers. Yeah, and we had the same stuff that the dealers had. Mm -hmm. So we get legal, like, mm -hmm. drug money. Mm -hmm. But we're not selling drugs. We're pushing positivity. We're doing our art. So a lot of people would gravitate to that. So a lot of brothers would come from Long Island, you know, and they would just sit in the booth and chill with us, you know, Buster. Buster Rhymes was just shout to Buster. Buster was at Black Caucus Weekend this week. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah Buster shout was out, out there. Buster. Shout out to Buster. Bus. Yes. You know, you got the Busters. You got Jay Z would come through. You know, and just you know, be there, sit there. You know, um, Fifty Cent would be there. You know, he used to come. You know, I wasn't there at the time. You know, because I Miami, Baltimore, he was dipping off, right? Yeah. 
So, but he was hand painting the gold for us also. 50 Cent yes. was working for Shirkin. Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. He could draw. <laughs> I said he could draw. I asked him about it. Ask him. Wow. Fifty, come on our show. Come on our show. Fifty facts. Exactly. Conversations <laughs> with hip hop classic. Yeah. Wow. So that's dope, man. Kyle, what you got over here? Because I know you. Okay. Um, exploring your Rilla. Um, she wants to know how did the digital printing um influx impact your business was it negative or positive like when everything started to go digital oh the digital process i feel did not affect me at all because if you understand quality and you understand clothing you know mm -hmm. you don't want something that's going to wash out mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't want something that looks like the real thing, mm -hmm. but it's not as authentic as investing in yourself and allowing your printer to make 15 screens to make that art look just like your art. Right. So it stays in that gallery zone. Right. You know, so digital printing on clothes like just not it's not part of the quality you know what like at this point I pay attention to it to the fabric to the printing process mm -hmm. to the cut of the garment you know to the dye on the garment also making sure that everything is is um, uh, organic mm -hmm. you know so digital print has no no real place in, in my in this nah space no nah, not not There's because you are you are a creature of customization you grew up at a time when customization was akin to hip-hop originality yeah. you created a a, a, a corporation an yeah. iconic brand based off customization and so you're not i wouldn't be affected yeah anymore. it's, it's kind of like a cop out right and like yo but all of them, yeah but guess what if i spend you know a hundred thousand to get this right i can charge this and mm -hmm. then you're gonna feel it mm -hmm. you know you're gonna be like it's gonna be the raise oh. right right you know you, right it's you gonna know, give you, you that official yeah, yeah. it's gonna totally give you different. that mm -hmm. yeah. it's all different wow. what else okay you um if you could do a collab with any brand who would it be mm. <laughs> it's now now today it's tricky um That's a hard one right there, because for a lot of reasons, like, I, I think it would have, have to be a Dapper Dan, you know, mm -hmm. a Dapper Dan Fade collection, you know, I would pick him mm -hmm. above everybody for um, maybe obvious reasons, you know, because nowadays you don't know what brands are doing behind closed doors and then they get shut down and then you're affiliated with them, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to go with somebody I know, you know, that came grassroots and I know, I know him. I know who he is. I know you can trust. Yeah, I can trust his, his character. I, I, you know, I can trust what he's about at the end of the day. And he's really a man of the people, you know. So that's a, a brand that, you know, he's already stared so much money into Harlem, you know, for kids and schools and this and that. This is stuff you don't hear about, you know? And that's his, his deal, man. His, his knowledge is just infinite, you know, just sitting down with him, you know. He, I was in the Marlin 25, across the street from Apollo, and had my little thing popping there, you know? I think that was like 89, and uh, Dad came over there. He said, I had to come meet you because my customers are talking about you. We mm. serve the same people. Mm. He was like, how much you pay here for rent? So I told him. And he was like, man, he said, come down here with me. Mm. He said, come right now. We walked down to Fifth <laughs> Avenue. He showed me everything. And I was like, man, like, I know I heard his name was popping. Yeah, his name was ringing bells. But I'm like, Shark Kings is we popping too, right. you know? Like, but, but then I seen that lineup of cars in the front. And see, 
in front of Apollo and all that, you can't really line up those cars. Right. But Fifth Avenue, you can. Right. And I see Detroit coming in there, Chicago coming in there, you right. know, Ohio, you know, and I'm like, I'm sold. Right. I'm here. So you was up in that spot? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was there when they raided that spot. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I was there when... Uh, Fade, you kind of like the Forrest Gump of hip hop. Yeah, I was there, man. <laughs> Why is he next to the man? Why is he next to the Yeah. Uh, when Sotomayor, when she came, yeah. and all the lawyers, yeah. like four limos pulled up, she came. And that has a, a sense because the, the day before, he said, if somebody comes in here and hands you something, don't take it. Mm. And she walked right up to me and I don't take it, don't take it. <laughs> Sonia Sotomayor yeah. came with the summons mm -hmm. and you ain't take it. No, I didn't. You know like, she don't. on the bench now, she on the Supreme Court bench. You see? She's an ally now. <laughs> <laughs> She's an ally now. <laughs> That's you know? Yeah. Wow, Faye. Yeah. And, but us being raided and pushed out of Harlem is what got me to Baltimore. You know, because we started going on the road. We would go from Trenton, New Jersey, uh -huh. and keep going down, down, down. Delaware, we stop it all. Where we know where people are hustling. We pull right. up on the blocks. Right. You know, Dad be like, yo, go ahead. We go out there. People like, yo, that look like that Dapper Dan stuff. Right. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, sometimes they was coming like like, like this, right. and then they'd be like, that's Dapper Dan. Oh, man. They put the guns away and everything. Right. In Virginia, that happened, you know, in a, in a cut. Right. What was we doing there, you right. know? Right. Hey, but then they're like, we're going to take you to the boss. And they take us to the boss, and it's like the whole world. So now we're going here. We never made it to Miami. We want, by the time we get to Atlanta, uh -huh. Atlanta just bought a whole truck. Uh -huh. And, and we had to go it. back. Yeah. Right. But I parked in Baltimore, and I stayed there. Uh -huh. and that's how I ran into, you know, to um, Mr. Hove, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So if Sotomayor, see, she ended up creating a Brooklyn billionaire. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. If they ain't kicked us out of Harlem. Right. I wouldn't. I'm not from the South, so right. my family's from Honduras. Right. Right. So I had no business in the South. So you would not have known where Jay was. So when Clark Kent made that call to you, you wouldn't have known had it not been for Sonia Sotomayor trying to deliver that. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, come on. That's wild. Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah. This is connect the dots on black culture. There it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some things 50. are meant. Hip hop 50. Right. Yeah. Hip hop 50. Hip hop 50. This is going to be a clip. What else you got? God. That was it. All right. Uh, just um, legend, um, you know, a lot of um, speak that into existence with Dapper Dan. Um, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Bro, um, you gotta young, appreciate you gotta the awareness out. to his story. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, daddy, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Eli. Oh, that's my son. Oh, wait, that's my son. Wow, I'm coming home soon, son. Yeah. I'm home. So, oh, yeah, that's um, awesome. That's so, you guys got a book out. Yeah, I've seen the book. Yeah, what's up with the documentary? Uh, Dave is the only one putting something together. Okay, the guy I told you about, right? He was. Running the jungle, and right. you know, he, he so he got footage of Jay, he got footage of LL Cool J, right? You know, right. he has all of that. He's the only one like putting something together that right. we can shop, right? But um, nothing on the horizon, as yeah. As a, Malik, you know, Malik Bowie, we need to holler, we need to have a conversation <laughs> because let me, let me try to just kind of like. Yeah, we're about to be done right now. I just want to say this. Like, a lot of times we overlook our institutions. Because we don't even know that they're institutions, right? We just be like, okay, like, yo, you know, that's that, right? And it's part of the whole part of our environment, but we don't really see it as an institution. Sure Kings is an institution. Not only were you a priority in terms of streetwear, you created the streetwear idea, but you also was connected in the hip hop industry in such a way where you made connections that created the culture that we now know. And for that, you should be thanked. Like the way Nori on Drink Champs gives people their flowers, you deserve your flowers, bro. Because yes. you have been a connector in the current of hip hop culture. 
And for that, I thank you. Yes. You know what I'm saying? For that, I thank you. Thank you, know what I'm saying? you my for man, joining my man, us. You know what I'm saying? My man, Faye from Shirt King. Uh, Shirt Kings. I, I, yeah, I don't, I'm speechless, Kai. Yeah.